Okay, so hi everybody. Welcome to our October meeting um, of the SLT. Thank you everybody for coming. Super sorry about my delay for getting in. Um, today's facilitator is Ms. Um, Ho, and our secretary is, um, I lost the minutes. Who is our secretary for today? It's me. Chivali. Perfect. Um, so if you guys are all ready to get started, and then Ms. Ho, if you're ready to take the reins, it's all, it's all for you. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if I have the control to take over the ring to call on people. Uh, I just want to make sure I have that function. I mean, I think everyone's just raising their hands and then you can call on them as you see their hands up. Okay, perfect. I'm good to go. Do you have the agenda? I do. Okay, so to get started, uh, we have the approval of the minutes. Uh, just want to take any comments from anyone based on what was circulated and revised and circulated again. So if there's any comments, I'm happy to take them now. If not, do I have a move to approve the meetings and a second? Um. Great. Can anyone else who just uh, second raise your hand? So that we have that. Great. All right. The last meeting minutes from September have been approved. Um, I think the next item on the agenda is to finalize our upcoming SLT meeting dates. And based on what was uh, in the or proposed in the last September meeting minutes, uh, it was a set of dates. I think the only one or only two that required some discussion, maybe is the May 18 and the June 22nd dates. Uh, I think it was uh, notified that there are some tests or other things going on that day. Do we have a proposal for another date or dates? Would it... Hey, Alex. Would it be possible to move that to, um, let's say, May 20th, which is Thursday instead? Um, sure. Because there's, in addition to tests, there is also, um, there is also a PA general, PA general meeting the same night. So that would, that would make it challenging. Okay. If, if we don't have to keep it to every Tuesday, then certainly I, I think we have a lot of options. So unless anyone objects to May 20th, I'm going to change that to May 20th. Any objections? Okay, I don't see any. I am now changing it to May 20th. All right, what about June 22nd? Do we have any conflicts or proposals for another date? Um, it's just been brought to attention that usually our June SLT is, is much earlier in the month and considering how crazy that all of the end of the year stuff is, um, it would be nice if we can maybe move it up as, a po as opposed to keep it later in June. By that point, the semester is already over. We're doing grades. It's in the middle of Regents, assuming that those will be happening in, in the spring. Um, so it might be a consideration to move that up maybe to the second week of June or the, the end of the first week of June um, as opposed to later in June. Sure. So that's, that's what I originally proposed, but uh, I, I think... As, as long as we are okay with the May date being very close to June, I think that should be fine. So what date in June should I change this to? I don't remember what days there are conflicts with. Oh, I'm sorry, Dad. I mean, if oh, we're following. Yes. Sorry, Samantha, has her hand up. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Um, Go ahead, Samantha. I, oh, wait, yeah, I, I think we tend to have a lot of work to do at SLT. Having them close together, I don't think is a problem. Um, I might suggest uh, June 8th, a little bit earlier on. And I think also sometimes there are certain things that have to get wrapped up for the CEP. And we might want to talk about those as well as submitting. We need to make sure that we have the uh, remuneration forms in also uh, because um, some of the uh, uh, compensation processing sort of ends pretty quickly at the end of the year. Sure, Alex has your hands up. Yes, um, uh, I, I agree. I think it's a great idea to have it during that week, um, except that right now, June 8th is the PA uh, executive board meeting. 
and the 15th is a general meeting. So maybe maybe June 10th in a similar fashion or the 7th, whatever, whatever works best. So do we have um, Jeff, an, ob uh, an objection to, what was the date again, Alex? June, June 10th or June 7th? I mean, June 10th is Thursday. That's if that works, that works. Okay. Uh, do we have any objection for June 7th? Okay, so I am now changing it to June 7th. Great. By the way, just a, a public announcement here. Uh, in the gallery view, I don't see, if you're just you raising your hand, physically raising your hand, I will not see those people that are cut off uh, from the rest of the gallery view. So you would need to raise your hand as the raise hand function in Zoom. Otherwise, uh, I will not see you. So I'm not trying to ignore you. Just wanna make sure you're aware of that, okay? Um, Ms. Yes. Hope, just one second. I think because I have um, I have to share a presentation and I have co-host privileges, I do not think I have the ability to hit the raise hand function. Um, hold on just one second. Uh, you don't. So, yeah. Ms. Dates, you don't. Yeah, that's the same thing with me. I won't be able to raise. So uh, I got you guys. You're both, my field. To... You're both in my field of view. If your hands go up, I will let Ms. Ho know. Thank you, Ms. Medio. Thank you. I'm all over it. So Samantha, do you need to talk right now or you're good? Uh, no, I'm good. I just wanted to point that out for the three of us because going forward, the three of us are gonna have that problem. So Ms. Maggio will uh, keep an eye on us. Sorry, who are the three? Maggio, you, and who's the third? Me. Oh, Should okay, got it. Giordano, Mr. Giordano, Mr. Got Shaffer, it. Myself. Okay, uh, I just saw a raised hand, but it went away. So I think we're good. Uh, do I need to recirculate the minutes or is it just to uh, give it to Natalie and that's good? Uh, yeah, think. you can just, Nancy, you, uh, uh, the, no, you're fine. Did we approve them so they don't need to be resent? Um, so if we can just go through the listings for each month for who's going to do facilitator and secretary really quickly. And then I'm keeping, I'm entering it all into an Excel file right now. So I'm just going to jump in really fast, Nancy. For sure. November, we need a student facilitator. Can I get a volunteer? All right, Julian. And we need a staff secretary. Oh, I spelled secretary wrong. Don't tell anybody. Okay, sorry, staff secretary. All right, Eric, you're a winner. <laughs> oh. <laughs> December, oh, this is going to be super fun. December, we need a staff facilitator. All right, Mr. Henderson, you're all over it. And an administrator secretary. Gary, are you excited for, your, for it this year? Thank you, Mr. Heber. Um, for January, you're we good need, at this. I'm all over this. Yeah, um, January, we need an administrator for a uh, facilitator. I can. You can do it, Miss. Thank you, Principal Yu. And then we need a parent for secretary. And parents, anyone? No. Uh, thank you, Sam. Thank you, Miss Song. Um, that's what I feel like in class sometimes. Nobody? Nobody? <laughs> uh, we need a parent for facilitator in February. Okay, Mr. Shafrin. I spelled your name wrong. No one sees it but me. Um, student, student secretary for February. Thank you. The right. And then we need a student facilitator for um, March. I can do it. Student facilitator for much guys. There's only three of you, so one of you gotta raise your hand. I can do it. She All right, Holly, you're a winner. Um, staff for secretary. All right, Ms. Dave. Yeah, I can do it. Yeah. Okay. Wasaki, you want to be facilitator in April? Sure. Cool. Administrator secretary in April. Ms. Pedrick, is you cool? <laughs> I prefer to facilitate in March, in May. I got you, Ms. Pedrick. <laughs> facilitate in May, and, and Dr. Haber's just such a good secretary. It's amazing. Absolutely. <laughs> Sorry, guys, I have way too much fun doing this. Um, we need a parent secretary for May. We're almost done, guys, almost done. Parent, volunteer, anyone? No hands? Come 
on, guys. Thank, thank you, Miss Jill. Um, we need a parent facilitator for June. And uh, thank you, Miss Murdoch. I hope I said all of your names wrong, and if I didn't, I super apologize. Um, and then student secretary for June. Julian, is that going to be your last duty with us, senior child? That would be so fun. June of senior year. Thank you so much. I appreciate secretary. you volunteering for that. Okay, we're all good. Thank you, Miss Howard. You can take it back. Great. Next, we have the principal's update. Sure. Thank you, Ms. Ho. Um, Ms. Ingram, can you just put up the uh, that first slide? Yeah, let me get that set for Great. you. Great, thank you. I just need to uh, get this presented, hold on. There we go. Great, thank you. Uh, so I just wanna go over some four key updates. Um, and make sure that, again, everyone is aware of this. Uh, there's been a lot of updates of late from the Department of Education that's gone out uh, via Twitter as well as through media. So we wanna at least uh, put some information out. And, and again, uh, these were just recent guidance. Uh, so four key things. Uh, the first one is parent-teacher conferences. I wanna give a timeline for uh, families and students and, and staff around uh, kind of next steps. So. Tomorrow, we're gonna be uh, sending out some messaging just again with uh, some timelines around uh, how we're gonna do parent-teacher conferences and how to sign up. Uh, we will be sending that out tomorrow and there will be directions as well as more information uh, about the conferences themselves. Uh, we'll have sign up starting on the 29th, which is a Thursday um, and it will be available through Talos. Uh, the direct, there will be directions about how to do that. And again, this will be sign ups for having the opportunity to, uh, to chat with, uh, with the teachers or your, your child's teachers. Uh, the deadline will be on a Sunday night, uh, which will be uh, November 8th. So approximately, uh, you know, uh, more than a week uh, that you will have to be able to sign up. And then we will release the schedules on the 10th, uh, which is a Tuesday, uh, so that families can see which, uh, where their appointments are. Uh, we are working uh, with our contact you know who is working on the on Talos to make sure that again we have these signups ready to go uh, and and again I just want to point this out um, you know while we've designate kind of two days uh, which is the Thursday uh, and the Friday which I think is on this time around is November 12th and 13th um, you know parent teacher conferences in some ways uh, the goal here is that we're always communicating and we're staying in touch throughout the year so you know, I just want to be up front. I know that trying to get to be able to communicate with uh, all our families uh, can't happen in those two days. And so we're going to encourage while we do have these two designated days in the fall, uh, we do want to continue to encourage communication throughout the year uh, so that, again, uh, students are aware of how they're progressing in, in each of their classes, families are aware, and then clearly teachers can provide and offer feedback about uh, a student's progress. Um, this will be really important particularly under the conditions that we're in. And, and again, I think um, updated grade books and as well as the office hours and different ways that we've been communicating with one another will continue to be essential as we prepare for parent-teacher conferences, but more importantly, as we continue preparing uh, and communicating throughout the year, All right? Um, additionally, yesterday, the chancellor sent out uh, the citywide grading policy uh, we received that yesterday and then immediately, I think uh, it was made available uh, as well to the public. Um, essentially, it's falling similarly to what we experienced in, uh, in the spring, uh, continuing to offer flexibilities under the circumstances that we're in, uh, along with just, you know, again, uh, the different considerations that uh, schools and families and, and, and again, everyone is being asked to consider uh, knowing, again, around internet access, uh, access to devices, uh, as well as just, again, uh, you know, all of the, the changes in guidance throughout from the summer throughout the year, you know, we're having to think about, uh, again, what are the flexibilities that are needed both for staff as well as for families and students, uh, particularly around uh, 
again, thinking about grades and depending on you know whatever grade you are in, uh, clearly there are implications whether it's co you know college related and or again um, I know there's pieces around uh, the types of courses that students are going to be able to take. So you know we're taking this very seriously. Uh, we did just get the guidance, and so we want to make sure our grading policy is going to be aligned uh, to fit the citywide. And and again, this is we just got it yesterday, so. Our administrative team is, is reviewing, uh, making sure that we fully understand. I have a principal's meeting uh, on Friday. This will be an opportunity for us to get more guidance just to make sure that we're clear and understanding uh, of the implications of the grading policy so that we can in turn be able to offer additional guidance to families. Uh, there are, again, uh, different elements uh, that we are gonna have to consider. One key piece uh, that you know is similar to the spring is around the NXs. Uh, and courses in progress. Again, this is around the flexibilities that we wanna make sure uh, kids have, uh, students are be able to, to be able to have. Uh, but I also wanna make clear too, you know, we, we set expectations around our instruction of really wanting to make sure that, um, you know, we have synchronous uh, as well as asynchronous instruction. And so far, and hopefully we'll hear this in, throughout the surveys, uh, that uh, I think we've had a good start in our remote learning, uh, particularly around students uh, being in attendance and being able uh, to continue to uh, to be in our to be in classes and just to, to you know uh, stay in stay up to date with courses so you know we want to just make sure we're continuing to build that momentum particularly as we're getting we're getting into uh, the colder the colder weather and you know remote instruction really will be um, kind of going full force we want to make sure that uh, we are continuing to maintain flexibility while also continuing to to set high expectations and keeping students on um, on pace uh, in doing in doing well throughout the year. Uh, as we continue to get more guidance on this, we're going to continue to work with our staff because, again, uh, we didn't get this until yesterday, but we had already put in motion our um, getting prepared for our first marking term and getting grades in. So again, we'll provide that in terms of our messaging, as I mentioned, with our parent-teacher conferences. Uh, to again explain our grading, uh, particularly for the first term, and then what the implications around the citywide grading policy will be, particularly as we get to transcript um, grades uh, or the final grades in the term and uh, wanting to make sure that we are uh, staying flexible, but also aligned with what the, the city uh, has, has provided. All right. Uh, the other key message that we also got yesterday uh, was about the blended learning opt-in. Um, Initially, at the beginning of the year, uh, we were told and families were told that there would be quarterly, there would be a quarterly basis in which um, students could opt back in into blended. Uh, we found out yesterday, and this has again been made public, um, there's going to be one window uh, for opting in and that will be November 2nd through the, through the 15th of November. And this is a one window for opting into blended. Uh, that will be for the rest of the school year ending in June. So really want to make sure that that's clear. Um, I know there are probably many questions that families have. Uh, we, this is all, everything that families received, Ms. Uh, Ingram sent out a letter today, is all we currently have. So these are also questions that we want to make sure of is, will there be flexibilities? Will, the, you know, what are the implications here? What is this signaling around remote learning uh, for the remainder of the year? Uh, there's, I'm sure, tons of questions um, that many folks have. We have them as well. So we're going to, uh, again, look to get more information about the blended learning opt-in. Um, and then one thing to note is after the window, what's been told to us is that in-person or the blended uh, opt-in will start the week of November 30th and December 7th. Uh, something to take note, I think, which is really important here, uh, again, is you know, uh, our numbers, at least for September and October, more families have chosen to go remote. And again, um, you know, part of our, the things that we have to consider is again, programming for the spring and what does all of this mean? So again, as we learn more about the, the opt-in, we want to get you as much information so that you can make a decision or as informed as you, as it can be in making the decisions because that in turn will have implications around our programming that will have to also ensure that we have a spot in the school, um, which could change some of, you know, again, 
uh, the way that we recently moved into in terms of consolidating pods, uh, there's a good uh, there's a good chance that we might have to go back to our four groupings again. Um, but this will all be contingent upon shot. how. You cannot do this. I have actual meetings. Okay. You're sorry. Uh, this is. This is how uh, again uh, why this information is so important, and we want to be able to provide as much information as we can so that families can make uh, informed decisions. Um, around the blended learning uh, option that will be, a, again, the window will be open November 2nd through the 15th. So I wish I had more in terms of uh, more answers. Uh, again, there's probably more questions, uh, but we will be sending them as quickly as we can in terms of updates. Ms. Ingram sent out uh, the grading policy information as well as the blended learning information today. Uh, so if you haven't had a chance, please read that. Um, these are letters from the chancellor and, and discussing uh, some of the rationale around the policy, grading policy, as well as the blended learning, right? Uh, and then finally, I want to talk about SAT, PSAT. This has been a topic of, of, uh, of conversation. And so I uh, want to hand it over to Ms. Uh, Pedrick and Dr. Haber to talk uh, briefly about kind of what we're thinking around SAT, PSAT. Dr. Haber or Ms. Pedrick? Pedrick, good. I'm good. I will say that we are still actively planning on holding the PSAT in January. We are meeting, making plans. Poor Dr. Haber has a lot of logistics to work out to make this dream happen. Again, it would just be for our juniors because we have to be able to accommodate students. 800-some uh, students, we would assume, and have them all socially distanced, have enough proctors, et cetera. So at this time, the January administration of the PSAT would just be for our junior kitties. And for the SAT, uh, I'm not sure how many of our senior families um, are interested in this because I had um, our director of college counseling, Mr. Macris, uh, tell me today that we have over 95% of our class of 2021 has already taken the SAT or ACT. So if you were interested in taking it again, class of 2021, in the month of December, I'm sorry to say that we will have to ask you to be looking around for other locations because all our efforts are going to be looking at January and we just can't. I'll just, I'll add some. Uh, yeah. I'll Thank you. I'll add some additional points to chime in um, following uh, Ms. Pedrick's remarks regarding the PSAT. First of all, we know uh, that this is a very high priority item. Uh, many, many emails, communications from parents and students to how important this is, and we're looking to you know, make, make it happen. Uh, so to that end, um, number one, uh, the I had mentioned previously at a, at, a, at a PA meeting that the deadline to order them is uh, December 4th. Rest assured, the order will go in for the junior, uh, for the juniors, the entire junior class before then. So we will place the order for the PSAT. Um, we, the, for the first time, or maybe the second time, the college board uh, understands that if we were not able to do it, they would not charge, they would not charge the school for the examinations. So there's no, um, there's nothing stopping us. There's no reason for us not to. We're going to order those, those exams. Uh, some other um, assumptions. Uh, first of all, that when I spoke about like if we have a 25% capacity and is it, was it like it would be one parent wrote like, is there going to be a raffle to see who could? No, we, we're going to do the entire, if we're going to do this, we're going to do the entire cohort, the entire 11th grade will have an opportunity. We're not going to, you know, make a, um, you know, some students to take it and some others not to take it. Also remember too, that on that same date, the uh, January 26th is the first day of Regents. Regents must be, if the Regents are to be administered, if the state goes ahead and has us administer the Regents, if it, this is high importance because this, this is uh, for graduation requirements. So we will, do, we will need to do so at the same time. As far as the regulation, and I, reading from the, the guide, from the, the coordinator's guide, it does say that, that all 
flexible ordering and administering policies for the fall testing have been extended to the region's January, I'm sorry, to the January testing for PSAT, which includes flexible start times, offsite testing and testing students across multiple dates. So I had mentioned about a 25% capacity. I think that's realistic, you know, 200 would mean that we'd have to do this. Uh, we would do the uh, administration if it's permissible over a four day, a four day period. Uh, we also remember that we have to make sure that there's ample room for the students who have uh, accommodations. And finally, uh, that we have enough people to do it, meaning we have enough proctors to be able to allow us to do this, uh, this massive undertaking. But uh, if there's a will, there's a way, and we'll uh, move forward to, and keep you updated on the progress that we're making towards this endeavor. Yeah. Thank you. Just uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Ms. Pedrick and Dr. Haber. Uh, just a few more points that I want to make around that. I'll start with the PSAT, first of all. I mean, again, we know how important this is for our, our juniors. Uh, again, uh, as Dr. Haber and Ms. Pedrick may mention, we're trying to work off some, some assumptions. There are clearly a lot of factors that are gonna be at play here. Uh, and right now, a lot, of, a lot of unknowns. And so uh, the recent thing that I had heard is the state is still determining about regents, uh, about regents in general and whether or not they'll be administered. Uh, and whatever decision is made there, then we'll clearly have um, we'll have a domino effect with what the city will then determine about that week, whether or not it is uh, going to be permissible for us to be able to, you know, be able to potentially offer PSAT if there are no regions or if they're going to make those instructional days. So there's communication that we have to have also with the Department of Education, um, which they don't know yet until the state designates that um, as Dr. Haber also made mention to, you know, uh, one of the things that will be key for us, and we will find this out, hopefully as we get closer to December, it's around personnel. Again, all of this will be contingent around having enough people. And so, you know, I know Dr. Haber has been looking at that uh, quite closely, particularly as we're closing out this calendar year and then what that means for us. Um, but the one step is that, you know, he made sure of is that we were going to, we ordered the PSATs because there is no penalty if we are unable to, uh, to administer it uh, with the hope that, uh, again, that we would be able to, and then we'll, we'll again, uh, continue to provide updates. Uh, one last thing around SAT is, as um, Ms. Pedrick had made mention, uh, the next one is December 5th, and I know there might be some families who have signed up, uh, just as a, as a note, uh, the November 7th date, um, when I went on college board, uh, and this is similar to what uh, Ms. Pedrick said the last time, is that uh, all of the sites that at least were listed in New York have been canceled. Uh, so what that means then is for folks who had signed up, um, you know, either you get a refund and or a, another date, and then the next one is December 5th. Right now, um, the test centers, there are 184 that appear to be open at this point. Um, and I think there's around 30 plus that are all in New York. Um, granted, they may cancel, but just to take note, if you have not gone onto the college board and looking at those test dates, particularly if you are interested in that, um, then please make sure you take a look uh, because there are some locations that right now are tentatively open. But again, as we get closer towards that date, um, there might be changes, but the College Board continues to update that list. Um, and as Ms. Pedrick said, you know, right now, because of the colleges uh, being test optional and the fact that PSAT is also something we are, we are strongly considering, um, we're not able to do both. And so uh, if you are interested in it, please look on the College Board and see what those sites that might be readily available for de the December, um, December 5th date. I'll just also add, if I may, that the uh, vast majority of highly selective colleges and all of the IVs are uh, test optional this year for the cohort 2021, and uh, the CUNY schools are running test blind. That's great. So that's it for the principal's update. Um, I'm not sure if there's any questions or if. Sure. Uh, I don't see any hands, so I have a question just to get some clarification. 
since we just received the uh, chancellor's letter regarding the grading policy, just wanna digest that a little bit and understand. Um, how does this work in terms of the marking periods? Is this guideline or grading policy for just the final grade? And when do you need to make that election? Um, yeah. And also for the marking periods for junior, I mean, for the seniors who obviously have a, a pretty critical first marking period for those who are applying EA or ED, which a lot of these highly selective colleges uh, want to have that sent. Uh, can you make an election for this um, during the first marking period? So let me just start with the first thing, with the first marking period. So right now there's flexibility about how schools uh, do their marking periods. Uh, and again, part of this is particularly from what the city has provided. Uh, and I think the, the key thing is around the in excess, if we talk about it in, in uh, particularly for courses that are in progress. Uh, we, at least from preliminary thinking is that this would apply for us uh, at the final for the final grade that would end up on the transcript uh, because again through our marking periods th those are cumulative but this is what would eventually get recorded on the transcript uh, which is really important now i think you know in, in case of this you know the way that we're looking at it we wanted to provide as much guidance uh, and feedback to families uh, with this in this first marking term and again i think one of the things that we're we're looking to do and this is miss pedrick and her team uh, what are what are kind of the extenuating circumstances that some students may be facing uh, around this? Um, again, I think in our, I mean, what Stuyvesant has done is uh, really uh, that first term we've done letter grades uh, in in this, and we we're keeping in in, in suit with that. Uh, but there will potentially be some extenuating circumstances for certain students, and so uh, what we would be making available would be the index but again we want to make sure that that's for extenuating circumstances as per you know kind of key indicators that uh, Ms. Pedrick and her team are looking at uh, we will definitely take in consideration around again college applications we know that um, our hope is that our seniors have been well aware uh, of you know getting the college applications and and continuing to stay on top of their classes so that again uh, if we do have those cases we can work individually with those students I was muted. Um, thank you for that. Just to have a quick follow up. So when can you make the election for the final grade, which looks like is the final report card onto the transcript? And also for the first marking period, uh, which will be sent for colleges, can we make an election as well? For those well, with extenuating circumstances? Yeah, I think that's where, again, once we get those grades out and then Ms. Petrick and her team are looking and identifying students that's one of the ones we'll be you know again following up on uh in terms of the final grades there will be again some in terms of uh, being able to change the grade in terms of again if it's an index to you know a credit uh it looks like from what we have here um let's see this for high school senior so this is the one for um, Ms. Pedrick. Can you make sure I get this right? Sure. Uh, again, for ones that applied for June and August 2020, those NXs from there, um, you will have your until November 30th. Nope, actually, it got switched to March 2021. Switched? Okay, March 2021. Uh, and yep. then that grading policy is describing having the same option at the end of the semester for passing grades to be changed to CR, which indicates meeting standards. So this was, again, I think, you know, as we're looking at kind of timelines, we're going to have to make sure that everyone's up, you know, up to date on the, on the deadline so that families have that choice. And again, we'll have to do it once the grades come out, then making sure that there's ample time for that opportunity uh, for families to, to make that decision. Okay, so that will be circulated. Yep. Okay. We'll make sure that you have those deadlines. Thank you. 
Uh, I saw Mark's hand up earlier. Mark, do you good. still Thank want you. to speak? I'm good. Thank you. Okay. So Eric, I see your hand up. Eric? Yeah. Uh, in regards to the grading, I wanted to bring up a, um, a discussion that either we can have now or later about changing the values for S, uh, S, N, and um, E, because it's often misleading for many of our students. Right now, S covers 76 through 89. So if a student gets a, has a 90 average security, uh, that they're doing much better than they think they're doing. And also 76 to, 80 to 79 is by no means satisfactory at Stuyvesant. So I wanted to propose to change an N to cover from 65 through 79, and then an S from 80 to 94, and an E from 95 to 100. I want to get some two other people thought of that. Uh, well, let me just say, say this. I mean, and I'm more than happy to discuss. Uh, we've already put that information out for teachers who are then submitting grades. So I, I would, I don't think it would, we should make the change now because grades have already, I mean, our process has already been submitted. I think what's key here is around, again, what we've laid out was we want to make sure grade books are updated. We want to make sure communication is happening across between students and families. So the report card is again, an indicator, but it's also one that's encouraging conversations so that we can fully understand where students are. Uh, and again, I think uh, Ms. Wasowski makes a good point. Like you're gonna use the report card grade for the first marking term as a data point, but it should lead to more conversations around what does that actually mean? So that again, what I would encourage is office hours between students and, and, and teachers as well as beyond the parent teacher conference designated days if there are questions, let's continue to communicate so we understand where students, uh, how students are progressing throughout uh, each of the terms. Okay. And maybe we could, maybe we could talk, talk about changing in the future. Yeah, absolutely. I think that uh, I'd be more than happy to, to discuss that. Um, I just like to make uh, two quick points. One is that we are 15 minutes over our schedule on the agenda for these first three topics and that we might want to okay. be moving to the next one. And the second is that the comments for the observers um, is officially closed. So even though you guys can still type in, those comments won't be considered for the end of the SLT meeting at this point because it's only the first 15 minutes. Um, so I just wanted to share that really quickly with um, everybody watching. Uh, okay. Back to you, Ms. Ho, just want to maybe move along. Yes, uh, so we have scheduled or a lot of- Okay, I'm sorry, Ms. Ho, Julian's hand is up though, so maybe this could be our last comment on this yeah. one. Yeah. Sorry, I'll be, I'll, some... I'll be brief. I just have some clarifying questions. On, I just want to briefly mention the grading thing. I think that is a, a, a big change that we need consultation of all the constituencies. And I think if we wanted to do something like that, we would need to have, you know, do surveys, maybe even form a subcommittee. I, 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 would, I would not you know, want that to be done too soon. But going back to the- you know, to the questions for Principal Yu, I just had a few questions around um, the changing of, of the deadline for opting in to, to blended learning. Specifically, I, I, have, I have like three short questions. They're mainly just yes or no questions. The first question is some students are wondering if they opt into the blended learning model um, and there are a few days or a day in which they do not want to come into the school building or they can't or there, there's some extenuating issue um, and they still attend their classes from home remotely, that's fine, right? They still get their attendance taken. I mean, our goal here, so let me say this. I don't know if the Department of Education is gonna change any of their policies around that attendance. I mean, again, there's, we are running a remote instruction regardless if you're in the building or if you're at home. And so I think that has some implications here. What we have said so far is we want our students to be in their classrooms in the remote instruction live. So we want you there. Uh, and whether you're in the building or at home, we want you staying on top and being participating in your classes. So right now we are counting you as present because you are engaging, you're participating and you're in those classes regardless if you're in the building or at home. So that's where we currently stand. Great. If we get further guidance, we will let everyone know, but that's how we're reporting it at this point. Got it, okay. Um, second question, um, also really brief. Um, and I already lost it. Um, oh, this is just a, a just a, a speculative question. Do you think that there's a, a chance out there for students to be able to come in every day, depending on how our numbers shift with blended learning, or are we just too far away from that point? I don't know, but what I would 
I think it depends on how many people will opt in. Uh, you know, I think the, so quick note, we consolidated the, the groups A and B together, C and D, and we've made it four days out of the five because again, the way that the groupings worked, people, each group was coming in two consecutive days uh, when we had four groups and then we just consolidated. So that made it four days in a row. Uh, I don't know how, how comfortable everyone feels on that yet. I mean, our numbers didn't necessarily increase per se. Uh, so again, I think there's some, there's still some trepidation around coming in, you know, multiple or multiple days beyond two. Uh, so that might be a possibility. And I think, again, we're always just having to consider, I think people are waiting to see what's, what is, what's gonna unfold uh, after January. But the one thing I would say is, you know, we're getting into the winter months and, or colder months. I, I don't know how comfortable people are gonna get, but regardless, what we have to plan for is whoever opts in, we've got to hold a seat. So mm -hmm. this is where it gets tricky because uh, if our if if everyone you know or if, uh, a large number of families and students opt in to blended, we've got to then create our groupings around that and make sure we always have enough seats. So these are all again yeah, yeah. questions that we are trying to figure out on with this as well. Just want to put that out there. Last question, just yep. a clarifying question um, about teachers in the building. I think. That there used to be like there used to be a requirement for teachers to be in the building unless they had a medical excuse, and I my understanding is that's no longer the case. And I was wondering, and I but I, my understanding is also that there's um, a requirement for a number of staff members to be in the building each day. And I know there's a lot of students who go into the school building, and one of the things they want to do when they're there is have a chance to speak to the teachers maybe in person during office hours. And so I'm just yeah. curious about what that what that situation is like. Yeah. So what we've planned for what we did for October and what we're looking for November is so one. We had a number of, of teachers who were approved for medical accommodations. That was kind of the first round. The second round through this new, new memorandum of agreement uh, were teachers or staff being able to put in for uh, remote accommodations and primarily around if they were primary caregivers uh, or there are other health related. And so we are looking at that list, all of which is through December 31st, 2020. And so again, we had to look at that crop and then the part of the MOA was also around whether or not um, tasks could be done remotely or some tasks of their responsibilities could be done remotely and or supervision of students. Because we are doing remote instruction, uh, again, we initially were doing a rotation uh, for staff members to be in the building. And then for November, what we've looked at, we wanted to, because our numbers have been so low, we wanted to make sure that we have enough staffing uh, for any supervision, any kind of emergencies and, and Dr. Haber's uh, come up with the list of, of staff and I think we have at least minimum of 30, 20 to 30 uh, staff members. Uh, we still have a lot of staff members who want to come into the building uh, and what we initially had was at least in October at least 30 but we end up having close to 70 <laughs> almost every day. So again I think you know we're, we're trying to be as mindful as we can about having uh, staff in the building uh, particularly if ones who want to be in the building and then those who can who can do it remotely. I think our bigger concern and focus has been around the instruction in particular and then and really trying to minimize any distractions, any technical issues. And so I do understand, you know, uh, students wanting to have some some engagement time with staff. One of the things that we started doing now is looking at open periods for uh, the different groups. We're doing tours for freshmen trying to create some smaller groupings so that they can at least for their 55 minutes, maybe listen to some of the music in the music room, come into my office and be able to do some, some icebreakers. But it takes a little bit more planning because students are coming in and out at times and we still have got to follow safety protocols and all of this. So we're trying to figure out ways that we can continue to do engagement and improve on that. Uh, but you know, right now, most of our engagement has been remote. Thank you. That all sounds amazing. I'm very excited about, about the touring around the school building. Um, so thank you. <laughs> Sorry, okay. Miss Earth, taking up so much time. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, we are moving on in the interest of time to the survey results. Uh, first up is UFT survey results. Samantha? You're on mute, Samantha. Just give me a second. I have to uh, share my screen. And sure. And Eric, are, is your hand still up? If it's not, can you... Uh, on lower it, please. So I can acknowledge you for the next round. Okay, here. 
Hello everyone, uh, my name is Samantha Daves. I'm a chemistry teacher. I'm also the uh, UFT chapter leader this year. Um, the SU, the PA, and the UFT, um, each of the groups sent out surveys to their constituencies. These are the teacher responses. Um, we had 66 teachers respond, which is 42% of teachers. Um, the different sections that we had were on effective instruction, PD, which stands for professional development or, or you know, learning for teachers, um, expenses, questions around student engagement, parents and families and health and safety. Um, a number of these questions paralleled the PA and the SU survey, but there were a few that were unique because they were simply uh, from the teacher perspective. So the first thing um, was on effective, effective instruction. And the question that was posed was how confident were you that you could deliver effective instruction during each of these periods, pre-COVID, spring 2020 remote learning, and fall 2020 remote learning? Now, I just want everyone who's listening to understand that that question is not just about how well someone teaches, it's about the entire ecosystem of students and families and teachers. Because sometimes, especially in the spring, whether or not instruction could be effective might depend on what each student might be going through. So um, don't just take the results here as the ability of a teacher to plan a lesson, but think about it in a holistic way. So the answer choices that teachers could choose from were very confident, confident, somewhat confident, and not confident. And so we have three columns for pre-COVID and then in the spring and then in the fall. And so you can see that the majority of our teachers pre-COVID said that they were very confident in being able to deliver um, effective instruction to the students. And then if you looked in the spring, we had a majority of teachers said that they were either that they were somewhat confident or even not confident. Now that we've transitioned to the fall, the very confident and confident categories have been populated more highly. Um, and the sum of those are very close to the sum of the pre-COVID numbers. To get some answers about what certain factors may have led to an improvement in effective instruction between the spring and the fall, um, they, teachers could choose from about 20 different options. They could check as many as they thought affected that. Um, so these are sorted from highest to lowest percentage. There's actually two pages worth of these. Um, the two highest were the expectations that students be present in the classroom, in the, in, you know, in the remote classroom, and that the students have their camera on. Um, one thing that, you know, so some of the SU and PA surveys had some of these, this wording in it. However, the third one was not in the parent or the student one, which is you have collaborated with colleagues on best practices. Um, that was a very lovely thing to see that so many of our teachers are working with each other um, to find out what's working and, you know, really well and share best practices with each other. Um, other things that are, that have led to a higher amount of effective instruction is the new block schedule, time to organize their course, new equipment, and um, also student mental health seems to be better. Um, you know, on the lower end of things, um, you can see there are just a couple things that um, that from the teacher side didn't think it necessarily improved the effective instruction. Um, take a couple a look at those things over there. Um, the next section was about professional development, which would be um, teachers learning uh, different ways to teach, learning about new technologies. Um, the thing was that for this question, it was um, a free response question. And so only people that thought that they wanted to answer it, answered it. So in the survey, um, it would really be just 13% of all teachers um, and 32% and of teachers taking the survey. Um, there really wasn't a common thread here, uh, except um, there were four responses that were um, 
that we're looking for possibly ideas for new uses of breakout rooms in Zoom. Teachers were also asked how much they had spent on equipping their remote in a classroom with monitors or laptops or iPads or whatever they needed, uh, different uh, dollar amounts were, um, teachers could choose different dollar amounts. Um, we had, you know, 18% of the respondents said they spent over $1,000 equipping our uh, remote classroom, 15%, uh, 500 to $1,000. So we see that teachers have spent money on, on, on getting their remote classrooms ready. Um, and ne the next question was, well, are we done yet? Do we need anything else? 40% um, of those um, in the survey responded that they actually do need some more equipment. Um, you know, typical things you think you would need for remote instruction, like a webcam, a, a stylus, maybe another monitor and headsets. Um, so that might be an area for further exploration. Um, the next question was, what percentage of students are attending synchronous classes? And um, you can see right now in fall 2020, um, basically everyone is. Like every teacher said that he, somewhere between either 90 and 100% or 100% of students are attending their synchronous classes, which is fantastic. Um, and then the next question was, what percent of students are engaging in discussion? And so there's this pre-COVID spring and fall. And so you can see sort of the highest chunk pre-COVID was between you know, 70 and 100%. Um, then if you look in spring 2020, that really dropped. We had a lot of, we even had 20%, 21% of um, teachers reporting that less than 20% of the students were engaging in discussion. Um, and now in the fall, we've shifted back up to that, that higher level. So that's excellent. Um, and so teachers were asked if they could give tips for how, you know, increasing student engagement, you know, to the students. Um, and really there was just like a lot of encouragement in saying just like, raise your hand, speak up, like, don't be shy. Um, you know, and someone even said, everyone's more or less about scared about making mistakes, you're not alone. Um, by joining the discussion or sharing answers, you get instant feedback and have a chance to identify mistakes and improve. Um, so the teachers really want to be very supportive in, in trying to get more of our students um, participating and talking in the Zoom and also asking questions and being very active about that. Um, teachers were asked what percent of students had their camera on in the spring. If you look at the bottom row, which is below 20%, 39% of teachers were reported that less than 20% of the students had their cameras on. And now our largest, most teachers are reporting that somewhere between 80 and 100% of students have their camera on. You know, I think teachers de definitely say that it makes it feel more like a classroom where they can see the students' expressions and, you know, students can see each other and talk to each other. Um, and then another question that was asked is what percent of students are turning work in on time? And it seems that right now, and this is for the fall, um, that we have somewhere most students are turning things on time. Um, and then the next question was asked, this is a very interesting result, is this like higher or lower or about the same um, as pre-COVID? And teachers are reporting that actually more students are turning work in on time now in the fall than during a typical year, which is interesting. I wonder if that's just because, I, I don't know what the reason for that. Maybe that there's a little bit less to do after school and leave a little bit more time to get things done. I'm not really sure. Um, and another question that was asked um, was about office hours. The question is, this, would the students that would benefit the most from office hours, are they actually going? So that is implying students that might need a little extra help. Um, and it seems we've got some mixed results here, a little bit, le you know, leaning towards the disagree area. So it seems like that's maybe an area to work on in, in getting the students that need to go to office hours going to office hours. And uh, then teachers were asked, is there anything you would like families to know? Um, there were a couple common themes here. One is that, you know, the, I have here, the whole faculty is committed to making this work and we are doing our best and we're, um, it requires a lot of work, dedication from 
students and teachers and teachers are doing their best. And also students are, you know, another thing that came up is students are working really hard to do really well and the teachers are really seeing that. So, um, that, you know, another thing that was pointed out that I think in the remote environment, it can, can be, uh, you know, there's a lot of screen time and sometimes it can be very um, taxing over you know, a course of a day or a course of a week. Um, and other things that were noted um, was that, you know, talk to your students about what they are learning instead of just focusing on grades all the time. Um, also that if, you know, we are students, if you, they're present and they're engaged, there's a lot of learning going on, even though that we're remote. Um, if students have any questions, you know, please do contact the teacher directly. And um, the other thing that came out, the last one is make sure that your child gets some exercise, fresh air and have has a, that should say dance party in your living room. So um, then la the next section, which is the last section was about health and safety protocols. Um, this mirrored an SU and NPA question, like how satisfied are you with the health and safety protocols? So with if you add satisfied and neutral, we're up at 88%, 12% said that there were places for improvement. Um, these were the choices that teachers could choose from as to what issues need to be addressed by the school. Um, the highest was repairing windows that don't open. Um, the next one was upgrading HVAC to take more of 13 increasing COVID testing, and at the bottom was uh, outdoor learning opportunities. And that concludes my report. Thanks, Sam. You're welcome. Um, does anybody have any questions for Samantha about the data or can, or can we move to the next constituency? All right. Ms. Ho, do you want to um, pick it up? Yes, uh, I was on mute. <laughs> so next up, we have the parent survey. Uh, Alex, are you up and ready with your slides? Yes, sir. Just give me one Great. second. Let me Take share it away. the slides. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Um, uh, so um, to kick it off, I think the first thing I want to say is um, this only, I think it's only fair to start this um, this survey or rather presentation results of a survey from a couple of quotes that we received from parents, I think it represents a feeling that many of us have. And one of them is to all of Stike fantastic administration and faculty, thank you for your fulfilling efforts you're making to educate our children. We have been incredibly effective and innovating, and we're so grateful to you for the commitment and hard work. Thank you. Grateful for how hard administrators and PTA have been working on navigating the school through these unprecedented times. Um, and um, kind of, a, uh, it is really, I know we're a very vocal community, but I think it's only, uh, it's just, we really would like to start from expressing how grateful we are for everything that the school and the teachers and the administrator have done um, you know, to get us where we are. So thank you. Um, and um, just a special shout out to Ms. Ingram, who has been uh, really amazing. And uh, you know, we just, the one of the comments here is basically said she's been literally working in the face of this unprecedented challenge and tremendously helpful and responsive. So with that, again, thank you, Dina. And with that, we are taking off. Uh, so this survey, um, we had over a thousand parents that responded with pretty good representation from different uh, grades. And as we've seen in the past, the uh, freshmen really represented a big part of it. Um, but it's, it's a very solid representation of the parent body um, across the spectrum, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll show more how, how that goes. Let me move to the next page. Oops, excellent graphics. I have no idea what's happened here, but Dina, off to you. Yeah, we, 
things shifted a little bit. So um, yeah, they, just a little bit. <laughs> all right. I know what they say. So uh, as far as plans are of the 86% now and um, slightly getting higher with each email, fully remote and 14% blended. Uh, at the time that uh, parents took the survey, 8% uh, were planning in November uh, to switch to blended. And interestingly, 24% were not sure yet. And the factors that were contributing to their decision uh, were the risks and benefits of being in the school building, uh, the commute and transportation, uh, potential opportunities for socialization, and their family situation. Of course, with the announcement that just came in yesterday about the change to blended affecting the whole year, we expect um, both the factors and possibly these percentages to change. So we'll see um, what happens in the next few weeks with um, this slide here on planning. Um, and uh, I guess uh, to the next slide then, um, Alex, if you want to speak a little bit to that. Sure, sure. Um, so um, kind of a couple of points just to, uh, similar to what Ms. Days presented in terms of how people, how parents felt about pre-COVID time, how they felt about spring and the fall semester. There's really no, the hu no huge surprise here that I think there was a general perception that spring was a disaster that we all had to deal with. And it's just, these are the times uh, we all had. But the happy news is if you look at the neutral and sort of satisfied, um, and if you look at the pre-COVID, which was 96% of families felt that, you know, they were either neutral or satisfied. So they felt okay about the education that, or the academic experience. We are currently, so we dropped down to 62% during the spring and we are up back to 89 right now. Um, and again, they, this is all clearly on the right trend. One thing to point out, and um, I know those of you who filled out the survey appreciate this, that obviously when you were answering, let's say if you were an incoming freshman family, you did not, your answer was not included in pre-COVID or spring remote section, but we've scaled it all uh, respectfully. So this is all handled uh, the right way. Um, so now the question is that what were the top perceived reasons why there was improvement between the fall and the spring? And again, apologies again, I downloaded the deck on my desktop and it all shifted. So sorry about that. Um, one top reason is better organization and communication of what work students are expected to do. I think it was much clearer. And this is, uh, this is kind of in line with what we also have seen. Now there is expectation that students be present in class during their period. And that's exactly what Ms. Daves also uh, pointed out in the survey. Uh, more effective virtual teaching methods. Uh, even though I, I, I think it's kind of aligned, we see the same thing. and. Uh, again, this expectation that students have cameras on, um, that, uh, that definitely contributes. So they're all contributed to the high level of engagement and as a result, they improved, uh, improved academic experience. It was interesting also that we found um, there were many choices to this question in the uh, re reasons that parents could choose for improvements in the fall over the spring. Um, but we found that uh, one of the contributing reasons that we spoke to, a lot of people were very focused on uh, grading policies during the spring and uh, platforms and having online uh, platforms and grade books, but it was um, significantly lower and only the 12th contributing reason um, that online grade books came in. And so I, I, we wanted to make mention that as, as important as it is to have grading policies and um, it was more the expectations um, of, and the communication uh, was more of a contributing factor than having, you know, which was very important, but came in all the way at 12. Wanted to make that point. Um, top suggested areas for instructional improvement also um, aligned. Uh, we'll see what the students said, but with um, what teachers said, uh, student engagement during classes, um, also effective transition of content and teaching methods to remote model, and then teacher proficiency with online uh, tools and systems are something that parents wanted to see. And then if we move to the next slide there, Alex, um, this aligned and overlapped with what parents 
wanted to see uh, with their own children in improvements because their top reasons also were um, wanting to see more engagement during class from their children, um, management of their homework and self-studying uh, skills as the top things and also proficiency with online platforms. So these all aligned um, with things that they wanted to see from both their teachers and uh, their own students. Uh, coming into the building with the uh, blended learners. Uh, so we saw that uh, there was general satisfaction um, with the blended learning that was going on in the building. We can see the percentages there on the, um, on the pie chart. So um, again, there was, uh, as is commonly talked about, an overall feeling of disappointment with um, lack of in-person teaching. We knew that that would be our exception model, that all instruction is remote, but um, they did feel that there was a lack of opportunities for actual in-person contact, uh, in -person contact with teachers and check-in meetings with counselors. Of course, we are not in control of the PSAL sports, uh, but that doesn't control um, everyone's disappointment and uh, desire for it to uh, be back on. So the lack of socialization and interaction with other students in the building. Um, I will agree with the cold temperatures, but we also know the reasons for it. Um, we know that uh, Mr. Brennan and the custodians are doing a really good job with ventilation and windows and the recirculation of air. And that is why the, the, it's cold in the building sometimes. Um, but, and then there was also the lack of access to the school library um, were uh, expressions of concern for the parents. Health and safety, um, we'll go over briefly. Uh, the satisfaction was um, at 82%. So people were generally also satisfied with health and safety and the concerns that they expressed was again, providing safe and social opp socialization opportunities for students um, is a great concern for them. And then also um, aligning with what Ms. Dave said, the increasing the amount and the frequency of COVID testing of course, we know that the DOE is coming in once a month, but there is a concern for uh, possibly increasing that and providing outdoor learning opportunities for students. So those were the concerns for, um, for students um, and among parents for health and safety. So with that, let me move on to the social emotional feedback. So um, about 29% um, of families were satisfied, um, eight were dissatisfied, the rest were neutral. But one point to bring up is and uh, uh, that actually parents of juniors participating in this survey reported the least satisfaction with the social emotion. For the full exposure, there are, could be many ways how this could be explained. And it's quite possible that the same result would have been if we were pre-COVID time. So this is just could be linked and aligned with a very tough year that the junior year um, is for, you know, for students. But some of the um, important concerns or requests or points that were brought up by parents. So most common requests is that regularly scheduled or mandatory check-ins with the counselors or individual or smaller group sessions or meetings that were initiated by uh, counselors. So uh, many parents brought this up as a potential area of improvement. Um, regularly scheduled homeroom or advisory meetings, another, another point that um, frequently came up. Um, the general plea to get students off devices and get them outside. Again, uh, this is, uh, we understand this is something that is probably more in control of families, but uh, you know, there are other conversations. But again, we know we all feel it and uh, as a parent feel that as well. Uh, one point about freshmen specifically, which is freshman students finding it very difficult to meet friends. And I know there are already some things that school is doing to help for those students that are at school, um, but we just want to point it out. This is uh, hopefully it's something could be done for um, for the grade. It's a very different experience than any other year, obviously. Help students with social skills, time management, stress management, mental health, and internet, social media, gam gaming addiction. So it's kind of going back to some of the points that were brought up before, where uh, you know what do we wish our students done better, and what are the areas of improvements that just there, there is a connection between these two. Um, 
you know, just something that we hope that maybe we could, uh, could be considered. Um, uh, there were raised um, questions about opportunities for outdoor in-person activities like clubs, sports, and meet meetups. Um, again, we, we know this was raised before. We are, uh, we are tr all trying to be fluid and flexible as we're proceeding through the year. So something to continue to keep on the radar. And um, there are uh, concerns about, um, you know, the nature of this whole current learning model and that the need to exercise and I think, you know, I know we are even during the, um, some of the physical education lessons, they, uh, you know, it's all about stretching, but maybe more could be done there and we understand their reasons, but I think we're looking for some creative ideas there. Um, with that, moving on to college guidance support. So um, this is only here, we only consider the responses from senior families at this point, because that's, that's the group that mostly where the, the entire focus is. So 63% were satisfied, 27% um, um, are neutral, and then 10% um, are dissatisfied with the college guidance. And I think focusing, uh, responding to the question, what were the things that families were looking for from the college guidance office here? More group discussions from um, for students, more one-on-one -on -one meeting for college applications. Um, uh, again, I mean, we understand some of the challenges with that, and maybe that's something that we should just take away and, and collectively work. And again, PA could be a good partner to, to figure out if there's anything we can help with. Um, but increased responsiveness from college office and increased support with college admission guide deadlines and requirement communication. And that is another thing. And support with PSAT and SAT, which is, again, we've already covered today. I think this was a hot topic. Um, and we hope, I, I really hope that we'll be able to address it. Um, moving to our one last summary point slide. So 73% um, of the parents were satisfied with both the frequency and content of the communication from administration. And um, I will just be very upfront that this, I was not surprised about this, that there were mixed feelings on the new format of the changes to the weekly update in the comments section. So some want the old format back. I know change is hard and um, expressed a desire for more communication and responses from teachers directly to parents. So I will uh, take that under advisement about the words about the weekly update, but they did express um, that more communication from teachers um, would be something that they were interested in. Um, the next point that just to point out and I know generally this is not something that we need to keep repeating at side, but this just this was such a frequent comment that we, we, we need to mention is there's still a parental concern about the level of rigor of curriculum that um, so that remains consistent pre-COVID versus where we are now and where it's going. It's not unexpected and we know that teachers are focusing on making it happen, but we just um, I think it's important that that stays the uh, stays the continues being a focus and covering the AP content as part of the lessons. Uh, there is a significant concern for overwhelming screen time, and uh, again, I know this is not the first time I brought up, but uh, I I hate to sound like a broken machine, but we we had to bring it up. It's just we couldn't couldn't skip this comment. It was so so overwhelming. And then the last couple of comments. Uh, oh, yeah, on technology, um, there were, I know we are working through a lot of attendance system errors. Um, I did want to make mention that um, permanent record attendance is on your New York City account. So, uh, but we are working through a lot of attendance errors. So that was a concern. Um, and then when I say that it is, they're referring to the ones they see on Talos, um, which are being reconciled. And then uh, possibility of consolidation of platforms used by teachers because they're difficult to track, which is um, you know, uh, under constant revision and consideration. And uh, we uh, obviously, as I'm sure all of you realize that there are a lot of a lot of verbal free comment information that we've collected. Huge thank you to Dina, huge thank you to Joanne, Connie, um, 
data. There are few people that really helped uh, pulling this together uh, to get the information. And we are going to partner with Dina and to pass some of those comments so they could make it to the right, you know, to the cabinet and to the right, uh, to the right groups for, um, you know, further consideration uh, with that level of details. And that's all that we wanted to cover today. Great. Thank you very much, Dina and Alex. Uh, just want to give everyone a friendly reminder with what's remaining on the agenda. We have 50 more minutes and we still have the student survey results. So just keep that in mind. Uh, are there any questions for either Dina or Alex? If not, we're going to move to student survey results. Oh, I see Samantha's hand up. Yeah, uh, thank you, Alex, for that presentation. That was great, um, enlightening. Um, one comment that you shared at the end was that there was concern about the rigor of AP classes. And, you know, with our new model, there's less minutes of in-class time. And I really have to, hate to have to say this out loud, but, you know, if we want to try to cover the same amount there, you know, one way to look at it is that you might have to increase how much homework could be given for AP classes to cover that instead of it being an hour. I mean, it's not good for it's, but I, you know, it's, I don't know where you take the time from. I don't, I don't know. Miss Maggio, I think is an AP teacher and might be able, she's nodding. I don't know if she wants to speak to that at all. I mean, we don't, it's, we don't really have time for this kind of conversation right now as much as um, I would love to have it. But I think again, it is like well, the teachers here are all doing their best to keep the academic rigor um, the way it is. None of us want to give a grade for a class that's coded that other students have, that have got, had to work harder for than say our kids are this year because of COVID. That is not something that stands up to our our professional standards either. We are all doing the best that we can, but at the same time, as we've said before, we will not be able to cover all AP content this year in class. And that's going to have to be done on their own at home. As, and we're trying our best to, to, stat, to, to scaffold that. We're trying our best to uh, help them and guide them. Um, but it's just, it's just for all of our classes because of the limitations of COVID. It's just like, we're doing everything we can. We want the rigor to stay just as much as they do. Um, and it's just the understanding that it's just a lot more work on their end than it usually is. And uh, an I understanding is... from parents as well of that. So, yeah. cause I know you see them working at home and I know you feel like that it's a lot and that they're overwhelmed, but, at this, mm -hmm. but it's just, it is wh where we are right now that it's yeah. just, it's okay. Sorry, and yeah, we. No, no, I, I think this is completely, thank you. And this is a very important clarification. I think uh, managing expectations, this is one of those things. Like that's just, as long as everyone is aware when you sign up for class like that, that's what you're going for during these times. That's, that's a reality. So, so just, a, just a quick, um, I guess, comment and, and suggestion. Maybe for those uh, AP classes where students are expected to self-learn a lot, uh, instead of increasing the workload and reading and whatever else, maybe in conjunction with the grading policy, uh, we should consider what that should be for the first and second marking period, or maybe even for, for later. I guess for later, it's already addressed, right? You have the option to go CR or anything else. But because of the undue burden and the new paradigm of self-learning in the remote environment, maybe we should have uh, some type of a leniency or something yeah. where students can have that option. I mean, Ms. Ho, we talked all about this all summer. We addressed what the demands were going to be and what the pressure was going to be put on students. And students still chose the schedule that they chose. So this is like this was a decision on the, on their end. But again, like a, this is a conversation we can talk about possibly at a different agenda because we really need to move to the CEP, which is due like in two weeks. Yep. Can I, can sure. I make a quick comment on this and then hopefully we can close this. Uh, you know, this is, this is information and data points that we all have to consider. And ultimately, you know, again, there are trade-offs that are gonna have to be, to be made. I, I agree. I think part of what we've got to get to is, uh, you know, there are places in which, you know, if we're talking about a grade, uh, there are all these implications because one, we're writing that in our in our high school profile that colleges will see around all of the different ways in which 
flexibilities need to be offered as well as again what were some of the constraints and then clearly you know the options and flexibilities that families will have if they're if they would like to change to a CR and then thirdly I think again you know this is where I know our teachers have been working tremendously hard to try to figure out creative ways to get through the content uh, while also trying to balance the screen time while also trying to balance the homework and it's a hard it's a hard balance but what I would say is this is where the constant conversations need to happen, setting the expectations. And again, I, I think too, we don't wanna, I think we also wanna think about what we mean by rigor, because I don't think we're talking about quantity here, we're talking about substance. And so I think this is a conversation that we don't definitely wanna have, uh, not right now, but clearly this is things that we need to continue to communicate. Okay, I propose we uh, add this to the agenda next time so we can more fully explore the server results and, and talk about this more fulsomely. So with that, uh, I am calling on Julian for your student survey results. Thank you, Ms. Ho. And I hope our, our results can sort of address this. I think, I think it might be helpful. You know, there's, there's different levels of constituency groups and I think students and what they respond on the survey might actually be different than parents. And I know it's uh, parents are getting the information secondhand so it can be a little different this time. But um, I just wanna, before, before I start screen sharing, which hopefully works, I just wanna to touch on, Mr. you talked about trade-offs and the concept of trade-offs um, and I think just an overarching theme that we got from our survey is that yes, there are trade-offs that need to be made, but we need to be really mindful about what those trade-offs are, um, especially when they come to students' mental health. And that's just something that we want, want to keep in mind as, we, as we're presenting this. Um, give me one second. Can you see my screen? Yes. Fantastic, okay. Um, so we sent out our survey um, along with the parents and, and the teachers and we received 482 responses um, 87% of those were students who were in blended learning and 13%, uh, sorry, 87 were in remote, 13% were in blended. Um, and obviously, you know, as we've noticed, you know, there, there are more freshmen um, who are in blended um, than are in remote. Um, and there are more seniors than, than sophomores and juniors who are in blended as well. Um, so everything we sort of expected. Um, yeah. Uh, this is my, have, oh. I don't uh, know yeah. if this is my slide, sorry, it's right. <laughs> uh, no biggie. So we actually got some great results. As you can see, a lot more students felt neutral or satisfied with the amount of um, learning and the quality of learning that they've been experiencing within the fall semester as opposed to spring semesters. So one of our questions was asking students to identify the you know, top areas for instructional improvement based on their experience so far. Um, and these were our, our top areas. Um, students had, it was a checkbox option. So they, they didn't only have to choose between these five. There were 10 options and they could select multiple ones, which is why the percentages may be a bit deceiving. Um, the number one um, area for improvement um, that students had was relating to homework. The number two was relating to proficiency with online tools and systems. The third one was having to do with test administration. The fourth um, having to do with engagement in classes and the fifth having to do with um, communication of student performance like like grading books and we'll get into more of these um, down the line but it's it's good to keep this in, in mind as, as we go through the following slides um, these are some um, comments that we received on that question that I think just elaborate a bit a bit onto that that I wanted to you know briefly mention um, there was one you know one of some consistent themes that we noticed um, was asking for for clear communication be that you know about assignments um, like homeworks or tests that are that are being assigned, or be that about grading um, and like knowing what your grades are through Jupyter or Schedula. Um, there was also, um, and in a similar note, you know, communication engagement was also um, a, a big theme. More engagement between students and teachers, between the students and students, um, and you know, there's you know, even we're, we're actually really grateful. One of our big priorities going into this year was a unified platform, and we have that. We have Google Classroom which is excellent, but um, obviously, and, and students and teachers alike are experiencing this. There's a lot of online platforms. It's hard to figure out how to utilize resources. Um, and it's been a steep learning curve, but I think, I think we're, we're at a good point right now. Um, anyways. Yeah, so similar to the Parents Association, when students were asked the factors that most influenced their decision, commute and transport um, was mentioned and risks and benefits was the number one factor. Um, as Julie mentioned, we talk a lot about risks and benefits throughout this, and we'll mention a little bit more at the end. We thought that we got fairly good responses as to how people felt about the blended experience, and I think we have some quotes later on, but I think that the main feedback that we've gotten is just that feel, uh, students feel they haven't been able to socialize adequately while they're at school. Um, part of that is just logistical restrictions, but we do think it's a, wise to discuss things like being able to speak with each other and whatnot. 
Um, another, another, this is, I think this is a trend across all of the graphs, you know, students are, were very satisfied with the safety measures that were in the school, um, which we're very fortunate for. I have at my Stymax here, I'm, I'm a blended student. Um, and yeah, so, so overall across the board, you know, safety has been a, a, a you know, yeah, despite the cold weather, despite the cold atmosphere, I think, I think that's, that's a really good job done to that. So I'm really grateful for the administration for everything they've done for that. Yep, so the largest chunk of students felt that the social emotional support and community building within blended learning, they felt neutral about it, but there's also a significant chunk of people that felt very dissatisfied. Um, and if we go to the next slide, we can see that 71% felt that, yeah, yeah you can go to the oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I was actually, so, oh, sorry, no. You could, 71% um, of students felt that socialization opportunities was the biggest health and safety issue that needed to be addressed and coming at a clip like, nearby second is providing outdoor learning opportunities. So in terms of feedback for the London model, like I mentioned earlier, I think people want to be able to speak with each other. Another notable quote is that people feel that there's no really benefit to our blended learning over remote, um, but I think we've had discussions over that in the past. Uh, other feedback again is outdoor learning, um, being able to access materials from the library, um, schoolwork supplies also seems to be another concern, and some people noted that maybe increasing homeroom opportunities could be a means of amending the socialization aspect. Um, so now we're moving over. Oh, this is actually still the blended cohort. We asked this question to the blended students. We asked them, do you plan um, on switching to the remote model? Um, and we actually got responses across the board. Um, we had around 38% of students who said no, they want to stay in blended. Um, but you know, 60% of students were either not sure or they, or they did want to switch back. Um, and we're also conscious that you know, this might all change based on the recent DOE announcement. Um, yeah. So we asked a similar set of questions to remote learners about their reflection. Um, their overall experience is pretty satisfactory, um, which is good. There's a large chunk of people in neutral, but overall I think we're pretty happy with the results we got. Similarly, we got good responses for student engagement. Um, I think over 70 students felt neutral, satisfied, or very satisfied with their experience. And in terms of social emotional support and community building, this is where we actually got a, a wider range of, of, um, of feedback. Um, you know, there was, there was this large chunk of students who were very dissatisfied. Um, There's also a large chunk of students who were very satisfied, and I think it ranges across the board, but it's the lack of, of in-person opportunities to meet each other and, you know, the fact that, you know, homeroom and, and other virtual spaces for students don't really exist, um, has, has definitely contributed to this. Although we should note that, you know, online student activities are, are thriving. Um, STI activities is, is functioning really well. Um, we, we have 900 students, you know, using, using, you know, using, going onto this website um, to join online clubs, you know, every week. Um, and there's definitely more students who are participating in these online activities. Um, so it's, it's mixed across the board, but this is definitely an area for improvement. Um, some, oh, sorry, is this mine? No, to me. Um, for student comments, we got over 180 comments about how the remote model can be improved. So we added a few, but general theme among across the improvements was that the 10 minute break periods were not were not quick enough to kind of like, kind of just switch between each class, but they weren't long enough to you know get up, go on a walk, do something like productive with their time. So in general, we saw that a few ways to combat that issue would be to do um, shorter passing times and then one moderate break in between the day um, and recording sessions so that students could watch the class maybe later in the day when they have more energy or patience to sit through um, a lesson and also not requiring webcams to be on. While they're not required right now, I know from personal experience and from things I've heard is teachers generally expect that your webcams are on and I think that's a good thing but it's definitely hard on students to um, be sitting in a camera for five periods a day. Um, and yeah, uh, extending office hours is the last thing I'm gonna talk about. It's, as Julian mentioned earlier, it's nice to have one-on-one -on -one time with their teachers, get to know them, and 20 minutes isn't necessarily been enough. And on top of that, um, a lot of teachers are not doing office hours every day. You have to schedule office hours 20, 24 hours beforehand. And that can be difficult if you have a question about something you learned that day in class. We think it should just be off hours should just be enforced, and teachers should be active on their um, Zoom link every day, so students can just pop in whenever they'd like. 
So um, we've had we had another graph that ha was under the same situation, but uh, these results are really likely to shift um, just because of the recent announcement, and we made a note of that uh, below. But regardless, uh, the majority of students said around 99% uh, said that they were not going to or probably unsure about uh, whether or not they were going to opt into blended learning. So next, we asked a few questions about the homework policy. Um, this first question really ranged across the board. How satisfied are you with the way your teachers are following the homework policy? Um, I think as, as students um, ourselves, you know, Sarai, Shivali, and I have, have both had this experience. You know, there, there are a lot of teachers um, who are doing, you know, really great with, with following the homework policy. Um, but there are also a few situations where it's not happening. Um, and I think, you know, there's, there's a lot of causes for this. Um, I think some of the reasons that the policy is being followed more is there's more standardization. You know, everything's happening on online platforms. It's just more, it's more, it is more of a routine to it. And I think that's helpful. Um, but at the same time, you know, we're trying to cover the same amount of coursework we cover in a normal year with, you know, 25%, you know, 30% less instructional time, which is really difficult. And it's also instructional time that's happening online. And so there is going to be, you know, more work and more homework. Um, and so it's about finding that balance. It's about finding that trade-off. Um, so we, the, this is actually a really important question. So we asked students if they feel comfortable reaching out to the teachers if they aren't following academic policies. And these policies include the homework policy. They include policies set out in the instructional expectations, policies about testing. Um, and it was, it, it, was, um, it, was, it was not, we were not satisfied with the responses we got. Um, it, it's disappointing that basically the, the majority of students said they, they don't feel comfortable reaching out to their teachers. Um, that, that portion of students who, who wrote depends or other, a lot, of, a lot of them were responding something about, you know, it depends on the situation. Um, like my teachers aren't really, you know, following academic, they, they are following academic policies. So I don't really have a situation in which I ever have had to do it or, or something along those lines. Um, but it's, this has always been um, something that we've worked on as an SLT and as a school. It's, it's been an issue for a long time, um, you know, in, improving student-teacher relationships and making sure students feel comfortable um, sharing concerns with their teachers. And it's something that I think we're really going to have to improve now, especially with remote learning. The, the lack of connection only, only worsens that. Um, and so these are, these are a few comments that we got specifically relating to academic policies. Um, and, you know, the, the first one I'll mention is, is about grading policies. And this applies to actually all policies in general. There's been a lack of centralization. You know, it's hard to find all the policies. Some policies are on Talos. Some are on Stata EDU. Some department grading policies can only be found by going to the teacher's classroom. Some are on, online. Some are outdated. So it's, it's a little hard to get a sense of what exactly the, the policies are. Um, and you know, once again, a concern about, about more homework, and we'll get into this a bit later, but you know, there's, there's a lot of students concerned about the homework load that they're getting, um, and there's, there's often less resources for them to be able to complete it, less support services um, to help them as they're learning from home. Um, the last comment was about online grading books, and this is, this is varied across the board. We, we didn't actually have a survey question about this, um, but we did see a lot of student comments relating to some teachers like not having their grading books public online or not updating them. Um, on the other hand, there are some teachers who are, who are really good about that, and it's actually, you know, factors perfectly into the way that they're operating under remote learning. Yeah, so similar to the parents survey, we asked students how they felt about the support they were getting from the guidance department and college office. So the guidance department, we asked the whole school. Um, there's definitely a lot of people, a lot of students that said they felt neutral about it, but there are some that felt satisfied or very satisfied, um, but we should take note of the other spectrum, the other side of the spectrum. Um, and for the college office, we asked only seniors and it does look like we got a very positive response from that. So we're happy. We also got uh, fairly good data as to how satisfied students feel about communication with the school. Um, uh, like it's noted, 61% said they'd like an update um, every time there is a major update, but I think that is kind of hard to understand insofar as we don't understand what qualifies as major. Um, I think a lot of students want to be emailed at least twice, three times a week, and there are also students who feel that we're communicating too much already. Oh, sorry, did I skip one? Yeah, oh, so we asked, we asked the same question, but about communication from the student union, um, and we got, we got a similar range of responses. You know, more students satisfied, very satisfied, um, and SU communicates through a lot of platforms, but you know, students affirm that email is, is the preferred method. And, and I'll just, you know, reemphasize Sarai's point that, you know, one of the, one of the interesting things that, that I always remark upon um, is that, you know, no matter what the student union does, we will always get criticized for, for at the same time, communicating too much and not communicating enough. Um, we'll have students who think we're over communicating and students who think we're under communicating. And so it can be hard to find that balance. 
Um, I think it's always safe to err on the side of over communication, but you also have to worry about students getting bombarded. You know, I get 50 notifications from Google Classroom in my email every day, so it can be hard to keep track of things. Um, so that's an important balance for both the student union and the administration to figure out going forward. Yeah, so we also asked about satisfaction with the extra extracurricular activities. Um, just some background for if you aren't aware of the things that the SU does, we have um, updated our SAG activities website, SAGactivities.org, um, which we worked on this summer and all clubs run through that website. Um, right now we've chartered all the clubs and we hosted a club pub fair last month um, with over 150 clubs that attended and presented and 650 students attended um, as like people who watch. Um, so we, we also asked for comments in this question. There are, there's a good amount of people that are satisfied, but there are some people that are dissatisfied and very dissatisfied. And I think a large part of that is something we can't really control as SU. People don't really enjoy having virtual club meetings. They're upset that their sports teams are canceled. Um, but we are working to make sure that clubs are having virtual meetings consistently. And we wanna make sure that they're engaging with their members and creating fun ways and exciting ways exciting ways to continue holding virtual meetings. So, yeah. Only a few more points to make, but our first takeaway was that policies are not known and that they need to be centralized or addressed in a main way. And a lot of students asked for um, that to be uh, something we do going forward. Our second takeaway was about workloads being inefficient and often excessive. Um, I just want to point out, you know, the first comment on the left, I know we're, we're going quickly through this. Um, the students shared that they have up to eight hours of homework a night. It's really difficult because of our delayed schedule. You know, teachers can assign, if they're an AP teacher, up to two hours of homework um, between classes. And that can be a really heavy load on students. And so there's, the, you know, and some, some of that homework is helpful, some of it isn't. Um, and that's, that's a nuanced question that, that's hard to answer. Um, but overall, I think students, um, and this, this is a consistent theme throughout Stuyvesant, but the, you know, students, are, um, students are concerned about the amount of workload they're receiving. And I think that's something that we need to address and we'll, and we'll get to that later. Um, our third takeaway is that the spiral of communication needs to be reformed and updated to our current situation. Um, spiral of communication only works if both sides are um, responsive and working towards it. So for students, we've noticed that as Julie really mentioned in the graph earlier, they don't really feel comfortable reaching out to teachers who they've only met in a 30 plus classroom situation. Um, and teachers often aren't responding or addressing the issue when the time is needed. We got some like testaments, testimonials about how complaints were made about um, tests being given on non-test days and it only being addressed until after the test was given. Um, so we're hoping that that issue can get resolved also. Again, this has been a main theme throughout the entire presentation, but a lot of students feel a lack of connection to other people. And we think that looking to create more socialization opportunities going forward will be really important. Um, and finally, our last takeaway, which is related to this, is about um, social emotional um, support. And I want to, I, I, know, I know we're pressed for time, but I, I really want to take a second to read this quote here because I think it's, it's very important for us to, to understand this. Um, and I think this is an issue that's not just affecting some students at Stuyvesant, but a lot of students. Um, I'm going to read the quote on, on the upper right. Stuyvesant has killed any love I had for learning and stunted my growth as a person, even more so this semester, which really surprised me because I didn't think it could get much worse. I'm exhausted, I'm struggling, and I'm afraid that I'm losing my humanity. I don't even have the time and energy to access school mental health resources because I'm trying to keep up with schoolwork, and I don't have the energy to meet someone new, a counselor, worry over how I present myself and my problems, and relive draining experiences to get help. Yeah, let that sink in. That's that's um, that's that's a that's a really tough response, and it's a response that's not uncommon. If you look at the other quotes here, students talk about their mental health deteriorating, the need for social emotional support, and I think this is this is a, a really serious issue that we need to address. Yeah, and I just want to add that a lot of those comments came from freshmen, so it's important to note that we should be emphasizing and making sure that we're giving freshmen the resources to make friends and socialize as in hopefully as normal as they could. Um, so yeah, finally, we just wanna give you our final suggestions based on those takeaways. One, make policies more accessible. As Julian already mentioned, centralize them, keep them in a location that students can easily access and look back at um, and make it consistent across the school. 
Number two, reform the style of communication, make sure that it's accessible for students and realistic for teachers. Um, and then finally, implement socialization opportunities and increase social emotional support. Um, this is a really big issue and I think it's come up across all of our surveys. So it's something that we can't really give one answer to. Um, so Julian Sarai, Julian Sarai and I would suggest that we have a subcommittee um, and include the guidance department in this and we would be happy to create another survey and go through the responses of that as well. That's the end of our presentation. Sorry for, for going over time, um, but I hope that was helpful. Great, thank you, Julian, Sarai, and Shivali. I think I see Mark's hand up. Do you have a question, Mark? Yeah, um, uh, just a couple of things very quickly. That last um, uh, sort of testimonial you read is certainly um, scary. And honestly, it's the kind of thing that we, I think we see many ninth graders go through uh, whether we're uh, in remote or not. Um, I have to say I also have, so, um, which which is wrong, which it's, it's terrible and we need, we long-term can need, continue to need to figure that out. Um, it strikes me how, uh, it strikes me that like so much of your, so many of your survey results were about the sort of positive view of what's happening now um, that, I, that I, I don't exactly, I guess, know how to balance that. like like you're saying the, the sort of large majority of students are um, uh, satisfied or, or you know neutral about their educational experience. Do you have a way um, that we can identify the people who are struggling so much? I know it's a big question. I can, I can, I can start off. It is, it is a big question. Um, one, I think this is definitely a question that it'd be interesting to hear Ms. Patrick's answer on. Um, I, I think that there's, there's a variety of issues. I think a lot of the students who are, who are, you know, no survey can be perfect. And I think like my, my understanding of a lot of these issues is that um, even, even when students can be satisfied with the experience that's going on, a lot of that is relative. And I think all students at Stuyvesant go through these issues to some extent. Um, issues of a lot of workload, um, issues of, you know, you know, wondering whether you're, you're losing your love to learn or whether, you know, this is what it means to learn. Um, there's, and I, I think students go through them to different extents. I think COVID has put, you know, greater pressures on, on all of this and it's, it's exacerbated these issues. I think, you know, I, I do think there's, there's a select, you know, population of students that definitely needs, that needs more support. And um, in terms of identifying that population, I think there's just two things I'll say about that. One is like, I think we, we need to do better outreach. And I really liked how the counseling department did surveys in, in last year where they reached out to students and asked students to check in with them and then say, how's it going? Um, I know it was, it was really personalized. You know, you filled out this math survey, but then you got an individual note from your guidance counselor, you know, checking in with you. And I, I think that that meant something. But I also think we need to build this into, into, our, into our school structure just inherently. We need to be providing, you know, support services for all students. You know, uh, we were, you know, Shivali, um, Sarai and I were discussing this because we were talking about how there's no homeroom this year. And we were thinking, you know, would it be a benefit or not? Um, and Sarai mentioned, you know, there's a lot of students who probably wouldn't want homeroom. You know, sometimes it's just really administrative and there's not much that happens there. But you mentioned, you know, there's also a lot of students who that would be really valuable for. Um, and keeping that in mind, like, I think, I think we need to prioritize the students who need, you know, the most support. And if having like a homeroom for all students would help those students who need most support, we know a lot of students at Stuyvesant who really need a lot of support have difficulty coming out and expressing that, reaching out to their teachers, reaching out to the guidance counselors. If providing these services for all students can help, you know, this, this smaller group of students, then I think that's something that we need to seriously consider um, in order to support you know, students at Stuyvesant. Can I add to that quickly? Um, I think personally from my experience, there's a couple things I know that can just work on an individual like classroom level, like things teachers could implement. Um, when you're taking attendance, starting with a check-in question or doing a check-in on before like your quiz on Jupiter or something. Um, I also think that if you um, take the time to extend your office hours, that would be a great way to meet new people. And also breakout rooms are really helpful, making sure that you're not just sitting in a classroom with 30 people the entire 55 minute period, um, switching up the breakout rooms, letting people talk to each other. Um, and I had one more, but I can't remember it now. Um, so yeah. So um, I'm sorry, so to, to sort of like follow up on this, the other um, 
one of the things that I think is frustrating for teachers, and this this is going back to the sort of um, that we're getting these two messages that are um, on the one hand maintain the rigor that is Stuyvesant and the rigor that is Stuyvesant is um, harmful. And it is very, and, and like, I, you know, I think that there are arguments that that is, both of those are always true. Um, and it's hard for us to, to, to weigh those things because there's, there's like two pressures happening at once. Um, you know, in, and I know this sort of comes off as defensive, but like one thing that would really, really help is if we could find a way for students, and I think this is actually on students, to actually like, do the spiral of communication for homework to actually let us know because we have very little way of knowing how much how long your homework takes um we know how long it would take us but we don't know the other the other side of it sorry i will be quiet because i know we need to see <laughs> i see sarai's hand up um just a friendly reminder before we're, we're coming up to seven o'clock and we still have 50 minutes of allotted uh agenda items we have yet to cover. So if this is something that we need to explore more uh, fulsomely, we need to put it on the agenda next time. So Sarai, do you have something very quick yes. before we move on? Okay. Definitely something to talk about later, Mr. Henderson, but the way that I interpret the survey is that a majority of students or a large portion of students are doing okay, but the students that aren't are doing very, very poorly. And those testimonials mean that I, I really don't think we can put it on them to say like, I'm struggling, I'm drowning. But the way that I see we remedy this isn't just we get rid of academic rigor, but it just means we ask teachers to perhaps create the sort of impression that if anything, any concern needs to be reported, if there is a way to regularly check in with students, any sort of fluctuation in your mood that they're receptive to hearing about that. And I'm not saying that the impression isn't there, but I'm just saying standard implementation of some sort of check-in might be a way of addressing it. Um, just to make up for the fact that we can't speak to each other in person. Okay, uh, with that, we're moving on to CEP. Mr. Great. Yu? Uh, Ms. Ingram, can you put up uh, the slides? I'm going to go through fairly quickly because it's essentially an action plan that, um, that, that I want to make sure I, I, I put out there. Uh, and while we're waiting for that, um, I just want to put this out there. You know, I, I'm, I'm clearly the new kid uh, involved in at Stuyvesant, and I think what I really appreciate of all of this is these are all pieces of information that we can all use. Clearly, there's a lot of things that we need to continue to communicate. We're not going to fix in one year. Um, you know, and I think Julian made a good point around this is things that have, again, you know, this has been part of our culture as a um, as Stuyvesant and things that we continuously work on. And so, uh, you know, again, appreciate all of the the, the surveying. I know Again, this was something that the SLT said we were going to do to try to figure out how we can get more information so that we can make improvements. Um, but I do know this, and I want to say this before I go into the CEP. I know how hard everyone is working. I also know how challenging the circumstances have been. Um, and so when we look and hear this information, and I really appreciate everyone, you know, again, it's never easy to hear some challenging or difficult um, information. But I hope that, again, we'll use this to find ways that we can probe deeper and, and be able to, uh, to find some, you know, some midpoint around how we continue to make improvements uh, in this. And, and again, appreciate all the stakeholders and constituency groups um, getting that information for us, all right? Uh, so CEP, I uh, wanna go over some key dates and just really just talk a little bit about um, what the action plan is. Um, CEP uh, initially was supposed to be started last spring and again there have been updates because of all the things that have been happening with COVID. Um, I put together the this is what we recently got in terms of kind of the the, the changes in the dates. Uh, so I want to put this out there and kind of walk you through some of our plan of action. Um, so from October 13th through November 16th uh, we are supposed to be uh, supposed to put a lot of our CEP, our action plans, our SMART goals, uh, for the 2021 school year uh, into iPlan. There are a variety of components that need to be inputted and the team has been working on. Um, but this is one that again, from October 13th through the 16th, we are to put in uh, so that we can submit to the district for review. Uh, 
by November 16th, we're going to submit um, our plan, which would include uh, the language allocation policy, Title III application, uh, language transition, uh, translation interpretation plan. Uh, so again, these are part of the CEP that will get uh, initially inputted by November 16th and so that the superintendent and her team can review and approve. And then we'll go back and forth um, from November 16th through all the way through the December 23rd to finalize the CEP, getting again feedback um, from the superintendent, which we'll also share with everyone. And then by December 23rd, uh, the superintendents will finalize all the CEPs uh, for approval. So by January 8th, that uh, the CEPs are, are made public and are available on the, on the uh, school web pages. And then for the remainder of the year, continuing to make progress or continue to, to make updates as this document is intended to be fluid and constantly monitored and, and, and adjusted accordingly. Uh, again, the time frame was made was adjusted because around COVID and all the things that have been happening. Uh, normally the CP would have been completed prior and I think these timelines had to be extended because kind of where we are to, uh, in terms of uh, the school year. Dana, can you go to the next slide really quickly? Yep. So part of the SMART goals and the action plan that have to take place revolve around a few goals. Uh, one focused at the high school level is the college career civic readiness, uh, graduation rates, quality individualized education program and the school survey. And then we can do another, which is a write-in. Uh, the SMART goal builder and the action plan essentially is inputting uh, target groups, kind of what is our form of measurement uh, through the different metrics that we have available. And then what are gonna be kind of like our baseline plus our kind of benchmarks that we're gonna be, uh, that we'll be using as ways to monitor our progress in this. Uh, so in each one of these categories, we have to put in a goal. Uh, now, one of the things I want to I want to point out uh, in this is, and this is a lot to do with me being new. Um, I'm having to review last year's CEP, uh, which again, there have been changes in terms of how uh, the Department of Ed has asked us to kind of do our goals for this year. Because uh, one, we want to see how we did in the previous year to see whether or not we met those goals. Uh, in order to then plan ahead for the 2020-21 school year. And so I recently just got uh, our embargoed, embargoed uh, school quality report data, uh, which also includes our embargoed school surveys uh, results as well. And so um, I just recently got access and now we'll be sharing it with our admin team so that we can, we can review and uh, be able to then start thinking more about what our goals should be for this school year. Uh, Dina, can you move to the next slide. Mm -hmm. So here's what I want to talk about in terms of next steps, because we're not prepared to talk about it today. Uh, and again, I'm looking at this and I'm going to be speaking with the superintendent again around kind of uh, the back and forth that we'll need to have so that we can make sure that uh, we're getting the input uh, as such. But again, as I mentioned, we just recently got our embargoed um, data. So I need to review that with the administrative team so that again, we can take a look at last year's CEP and, and see how we did uh, in terms of meeting our goals so that we can then start drafting preliminary SMART goals. Um, what I'd like to do is create a Google document similar to what we did um, with some of the instructional expectations. Uh, I wanna put in there how we're uh, expected to kind of come up with our drafts uh, for our goals so that we can share with the SLT and then provide feedback accordingly. Uh, I've got to work with our administrative team uh, next week to be able to do this and get some preliminary uh, goals in this around those four categories uh, so that we can then have you all take a look and add in, and offer input and feedback, um, which again, we're going to see if we can push for uh, November 12th that we would get some of your feedback for this. Uh, we've got to submit to the district by the November 16th and then again, uh, from that point on, there will be some back and forth with uh, feedback from the superintendent, which then again can share back with our SLT and we'll coordinate it around our dates when we have SLT uh, so that we can eventually get it finalized and that it can be posted uh, publicly on January 8th. Okay. Uh, so at this point, I just wanted to walk you through because again, we're getting information 
I haven't had uh, a lot of our school data until this recently got that embargo data, uh, which I need to review with our team to be able to then look at, again, how we performed in the 1920 school year, uh, both from just overall performance outcomes, uh, as well as in relation to what we had put out for the 2019-20 CEP and see how we had progressed. Uh, but I wanted to at least quickly walk you through uh, what, we're, what we're thinking in terms of being able to develop um, and draft some preliminary 2021 SMART goals and action plans for the CEP. Right. So I know I went through that pretty quickly, but also know that uh, we are running over time, but I uh, wanted to answer any questions uh, if you had questions around the CEP. The principal use, so as you said, you're going to share that uh, CP on Google Documents so we can review and we can put the comments on? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things that I think worked really well was when we kind of did a shared document, uh, at least uh, during this, I guess in August, by September, um, people were able to offer some, uh, through the shared doc, some input. And again, the goal here is to be able to get some feedback uh, before we submit it to the superintendent, who then in turn, our team will also provide feedback. So there'll be some back and forth on this, but it would be nice to, to see and get feedback from, from our SLT. Great, I don't see any other hand up. So next, thank, thank you, Principal Yu. Uh, next, we have an update from Student Extracurricular Activities Guidance Subcommittee. Take yeah. it away, Eric. Oh, uh, Shane, did you want to? Yeah, I can do it because that was sorry. That was uh, yes. uh, oh. and Eric can chime in uh, accordingly. But thank uh, uh, you know, Mr. Masowski uh, was able to kind of kind of corral us to have an initial conversation uh, just to talk about supervision of extracurricular activities. Uh, and again, this was kind of informal. We know we want to have more voices in this, but initially what it really was, was just getting a better grasp of kind of what's currently happening and some of the guidance that we want to consider uh, for things that are happening remotely as well as much more longer term when we eventually get back into the building and we have all our clubs and pubs and, uh, and different activities that are taking place. But ultimately uh, what happens, we met on October 20th uh, and had an initial conversation. We had a few parents um, and staff members and sorry students, we, we uh, should have had you there as well. Uh, but your voice I think was well represented by Mr. Palazzo about um, making sure that uh, we retain quite a bit of what we do at Stuyvesant in, um, in terms of extracurriculars. Uh, point of it being is uh, it, was a, it was a good discussion and, and good learning for me. Uh, I know what's made Stuyvesant really uh, a dynamic place is also a lot of things that happen after school uh, in which some of, you know, we were talking about some of the social emotional, um, I know a lot of that happens after school as well. And so we, um, you know, we wanna make sure that again, we're finding ways both from the remote environment and in the, you know, when we eventually get together. But ultimately uh, what I wanted to kind of get a better sense of is, you know, we wanna be very mindful about all the activities that are taking place, not because we wanna micromanage, but because we wanna ensure the safety uh, regardless if it's remote or eventually when it gets back in the building. And so wanted to get a better sense of, again, you know, what might be some norms or expectations that we can provide to students and staff about how we're going to do this. And so essentially that conversation was really geared around that. Uh, Mr. Palazzo said he would be speaking with the SU around some possible norms and expectations, which they recently drafted and submitted, gave to me, uh, which then I'll be sharing with this group as well. Um, or the, the, the smaller group that, that convened on the, on the 20th so that we can continue to progress around what makes sense for, um, what makes sense around how we best uh, support extracurricular activities uh, while also feeling uh, ensured that there's, you know, again, enough supervision to allow, uh, you know, things to, to go on in a, in a, in a safe way. So, uh, that's really been the start of the conversation. You know, again, I think this is also going to continue to, we're going to need to continue to have the conversation, particularly as, again, I think the need for uh, the extracurricular activities, both remote and then eventually in person is becoming very clear. Uh, we just want to make sure we're creating some expectations so uh, we are ensuring that this is uh, going to be fruitful for everyone. Um, and so going to take a look at the initial norms and expectations that the SA SU put together. 
We'll provide some feedback on this. And then again, we'll continue to have these ongoing conversations so that we can continue uh, to ensure that we're able to continue with the extracurriculars, but doing so in a, in a, in a safe way. Uh, Mr. Wilsowski, I don't know if there's anything you want to add. No, sounds great. great. We're just trying uh, to maintain maintain the uh, uh, environment that we've had for a long time, a Stuyvesant in a safe way. So, and also adapting that to the remote environment somehow. Okay. Um, a question was raised: Are these survey results? going to be made available on some type of a website or somewhere where folks can see? But prior to us answering that, let's check with the SLT members as to their question. I don't see any hands raised. Mr. Julie, Julie. Hand raised. sorry, I'm a co-host, so I can't raise my, um, my blue hand. Oh. I, uh, to well, that I'm question- sorry, you were blocked. I didn't see you, I'm so sorry. No, no, no worries. No, I, I understand. How, uh, um, and to, to that question, actually, the, the SU always sends our, our, our surveys out. I, I would really suggest um, like putting together a Google Drive folder, maybe, um, you know, Ms. Days, Mr. Schaffern and I can coordinate that. I, I don't know, we did that over the summer and it was helpful to have those presentations in one place. I just wanted to go back to this student extracurricular activity um, committee, which had no students on it, which is really disappointing to me. Um, not only because it's a violation of our bylaws that we can't host a subcommittee meeting without a constituency group represented. Um, the fact that this meeting was scheduled, attended by all the constituencies except the students. Um, we were not informed about it. We only realized it um, when Mr. Palazzo reached out to us afterwards to let us know. Um, it, it really disappoints me. It disheartens me. I thought, I thought that, that this committee was better than that. Um, and like the, the way that student extracurricular, extra, yeah, the way that student extracurricular activities run in our school is, is very unique for most schools. Um, it's, it's, an, it's an incredibly unique ecosystem that's, that's run entirely by students, um, entirely by the student union um, with the support of Mr. Palazzo. Um, and we put a lot of effort into maintaining these systems into running sty activities into doing all this. Um, and I, yeah, I'll say it again, it's just disappointing that we weren't included at that meeting, especially with all the work that we've done and, and the proactivity we've had with all this. Um, and I know, you know, part of that discussion was that meeting was about, you know, transferring control over to adults and like, there was propositions of you know, forcing every club to have a faculty advisor and what makes, you know, life at, you know, student life at Stuyvesant thrive um, is, is these extracurricular activities. These, you know, almost 200 different clubs that get to run um, because of the way our rules are structured and because of the way that we function. Um, and I just, I just want to emphasize that, you know, we need to have collaborative discussions going forward. These need to be things that we talk about together and come from mutual understanding. Um, especially, especially, you know, this is something that, you know, I, I know a lot of teachers may have experience using STA activities and interacting with these interfaces, but like parents might not be very familiar with it. Um, this is something that we, that we can share a lot of information about. And before we make any decisions, before we go to these lanes, I think, I think we need to do this collaboratively. Um, and, you know, we, you know, after hearing from Mr. Palazzo, we developed a list of, of rules and norms for meetings. You know, we're very on top of this. We, we, we have, you know, we're, we're here to support students. You know, as we said, we work with the Singram to host a seven day club pub fair for all students. You know, we're, we're making, we, we invented a, an, an online spot for posters to be included on the Sty Activities website. So students can advertise meetings. Meetings can be posted, you know, in, in this forum that only Stives and students can see, but that's publicly accessible. And we're seeing massive success from that. And I would hate to see that disappear. Um, and I would hate to see, you know, changes come to that without consultation of students. Um, so I just, wanted, I just wanted to make that point. I see uh, Eric's hand up. Yeah, there, the, uh, that wasn't intentional. Um, when we formed the subcommittee last SLT meeting, we asked for volunteers and uh, the chair said and that- we all raised our hands. Sarai, Shavali and I, sorry. I, I know it, I, whoever, whoever I think was facilitating said that, um, told whoever wanted to volunteer to email me because we had to move on with the meeting. Um, and I checked with the, I mean, there was, there was no intent by that at all. I mean, the, as, a, as a teacher representative, the first thing I did to get, try to get another teacher on board was ask Mr. Palazzo because that would be the teacher we'd want to have on this subcommittee. So, I mean, I would, there was, uh, I wouldn't read into that because the, the whole, uh, Mr. Palazzo opened the meeting as well too, made the first comments about how impressive our extracurricular program is at Stuyvesant and what a great job the students do. And that actually, that really set the tone for the meeting. Um, and I can say that, that Principal Yu was open to, was 
really want to embrace that as well. And it hasn't, while he hasn't seen it happen at school, um, I don't think there's any, there's any effort to shut down the clubs or, or, um, and we also know what it's, it's incredibly difficult to get a faculty member in, in every single room as well. So I just don't want to make this the focus of the subcommittee because it's really, it's really like, how can we, how can we enable, like, how can we help the students do what they've been doing so well in a safe environment? That's, that's all it is. Okay, so why don't we have Mr. Wasowski before the next subcommittee meeting, why don't we send out an email to the entire SLT asking for any additional members who aren't included in the first meeting so that we make sure that something like this does not happen again. Mm -hmm. um, since we didn't have a list that was in the minutes, which we saw um, and uh, go from there. Does, and then Julian, you've got a comment and then we can wrap it up because we're 15 minutes over already. I'm sorry, I, I hate when our meetings go overdue. I just want to say this is, this is simply a matter of the bylaws. This is like, and this is normally we're actually really good about the bylaws. This is just a matter of we need every consistency group at the table. It's not a matter of, you know, who raised their hands and who didn't raise their hands. Um, even if they did, I, it, it's just we, we need everyone there and we need to be thoughtful about each other when we're having these conversations and, and, and consider each other. And, and um, it, it's, yeah, it is in our bylaws and, that, and that's a reason that should be enforced. But it also just, just be the way we run things. We shouldn't, we shouldn't run things without including members and we and I, I know Mr. Blotson would have done an incredible job of representing us. Um, I just I, I still think this is this is an issue and I, I just want to make sure that sticks that point sticks that we need students to be at these subcommittees. Okay, um, we're moving to the last agenda item, which is observer comments. Uh, so since this oh, actually, is actually Nancy, uh, Sorry, oh, sorry, I know you don't see me. I, 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 I'm not going to be long. And I think this is one of those situations where I completely want to stress out. This is, I, I'm not going to go for, for much that. I think there are situations we just need to admit that there is something, whatever happened, should not have happened. And I think that's in, I, I understand that we, you know, there were, there were kind of some perceived reasons why it happened, but it's just, sometimes I think when you just need to say that it should not have taken place. So I fully support that student union representatives should have been part of this committee, particularly given the topic. So thank yep. you. So I, I'll just put this out there. This is on me and I, I made a mistake. Uh, again, I know, you know, we were, there was a lot of miscommunication on that point taken, very well taken and I get it. Uh, the goal here will be that we will uh, make sure that all stakeholders and constituency groups are uh, our representative as the principal. I, I take responsibility for that and want to make sure that it's loud and clear. We got it. We will, we won't have those miscommunications. And again, as Mr. Wasowski said, there was no malintent, but clearly it's important to have all the voices so that we can make decisions together. Uh, fortunately, no decisions were made, uh, but this is going to be one of which where we want all the voices because this is important around supervision, not necessarily micromanagement, um, but as the principal of the school, I want to be very clear that Again, I want to keep the culture of our school, uh, but there are also limitations and, and one fold I'm going to make sure that uh, we can all do this in a safe way because at the end of the day, um, you know, we do have a staff here. We have an obligation to our students and our, and our families. Uh, and so we want to do this as congruently and as collectively as we, as we can. Um, but I also want to feel very secure knowing that our students are in a safe environment, particularly after hearing all the things around social emotional uh, as well, because all the things that are happening, I need to also know that there is a way that, uh, again, we can we can just make sure that uh, students are are safe in this environment. All right, um, Ms. Ho. Normally, we would, uh, if we had time permitting, we would move on to the comments. But today, but we are already 15 minutes over of our allotted time, um, and so the uh, 11 comments that have been posted will be shared with all members of the SLT. And then we can use those comments as a guiding force for possible agenda items for our next agenda. But I think it's been a really long day and it would be nice if we could adjourn for the night. Um, and I will and come back in, what month is it? November, come back in November. Um, if anybody wants to, I don't know, first that or whatever, do we have to, can I just adjourn? Can we just say adjourn? Yes, we, we I'll second move it. to adjourn. I'll second it. I'm moving second. to adjourn. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, Ms. Ingram will send the list of comments to all of the SLT members. Um, 
within the next few days so you have it and then for the for the three head constituencies just remember to get your agenda items to me 10 days before our next meeting so that I can meet with the principal to get our next agenda uh, together for the FLT. This, Mr. Yu, did you have anything, Principal Yu? Sorry. Yeah, I just want to, can I just close out with this um, again? Uh, and this measure, I appreciate what you said. It's been a long day for everyone. I don't want to end on a sour note. Um, all the points that were well taken, let's use this information to get better. And that's the goal here. Uh, and I, you know, again, and I promise we will, we'll continue to get better. We've got to be collaborative. We need everyone's contributions. Uh, and so it's important that points are being made. Every opinion that came out today was really important and we will, we'll get better at this. And, uh, and that's you know, something that I wanna make sure of. Uh, so again, appreciate everyone being very open and transparent uh, about uh, their thoughts and then let's use that to, to continue to get better, okay? Have a great month, everybody. Great, Thank thanks you. everyone.